of the PHNX Facts Podcast, right here on PHNX. My name is Derek Montia. Of course, I'm occasionally known as your mayor of PHNX. This is my vice mayor and your thunderstick, the one and only Jesse Friedman. Jesse, the MLB regular season is here. Well, not here, but in Seoul, Korea, but it's still here <laughs> as in time-wise. Um, and the first game of the season between the Dodgers and the Padres has also already delivered some incredible moments, some wild things happening, and once again, confirmation that the baseball gods love the Dodgers during the regular season and only during the regular season. And no, but, no surprises there, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, it was it was a great game. I I was like, hey, how fun would it be if the Padres beat the Dodgers in this first game? I know it's not a big deal. I know it's not. It doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of a hundred and sixty-two game season. These two teams still have to come back from playing this two game series and then play more spring training games. It's so wild, right? Their schedule. I hope this screws up both of these teams' schedules and their years the same way it did to the Diamondbacks when they went to Australia. But the Padres did do a great job of holding the Dodgers up until late in the game when one of the craziest things I have ever seen happened happened to poor Jake Cronenworth. Uh, first, we have to get to the fact that John Morosi did curse uh, the Dodgers because, or the Padres, I should say, uh, because he tweeted this out. Uh, this was after the seventh inning. He said the Padres have allowed one earned one unearned run through seven innings. San Diego is six outs away from winning the first game of the MLB season. <laughs> it's like he was actively trying to do it, right? He was trying to change the course of history with that tweet, right? <laughs> I honestly can't believe it's real. It like, is a real like, thing <laughs> that he really said. Yes. yes. Of, of all the of all the tweets that we like, you know, make make jokes like this about over the years, that, that's about as egregious as they come. It's which one I, of the I worst. say that as someone who really likes JP Morosi. I got I got to know <laughs> him throughout guy. the playoffs. He's a great guy. But that, that's a yeah, that's that's a pretty funny tweet. Uh did you stay up and watch this baseball? I game? did. I well I I did I did miss the beginning of it because I had a hard time waking up at three o'clock in the morning. Like, did we need to do that? Could it have not been a day game in Seoul so that then it would have been on here in a reasonable yeah. time? I had a real hard time uh, getting up. So I I, I, I I woke up and I went back to sleep and I woke up. I was DVRing it. So if anything crazy happened, I could see it. But it maintained, you know, the, the close game for everything up until, you know, once that that eighth inning came around and it, it, once it started happening, I knew it was going to happen. They had the bases loaded with no outs. They get, they got, they got out of it. It seemed like they were going to get out of it. You know, they gave up one run. It tied the game. Padres had that one run lead up to that point, but you just knew, you just knew watching it. You were like, Oh, here it is. Eighth inning bases loaded. No outs. The <laughs> Dodgers are just going to put it on the Padres and they did, but in a way I couldn't have possibly imagined a Taylor made double play ball to Jake Cronenworth, one of the best infielders in baseball. Eh, yeah, he's all right. He's, he's all right. right. Let's but not go too crazy I with just, Jake Cronenworth's defense I mean, the here. The poor guy. <laughs> uh, he played the ball exactly as he should, and the ball busts through his glove. Jesse, I couldn't believe that this was something that actually happened. I really couldn't. I mean, I know this has happened in baseball. I doubt that it's, you know, the last time we'll even see an equipment failure happen this season. They charge Cronenworth with an error for this. That's what's the most egregious. His glove deserves the goddamn error, not Jake. Jake did nothing wrong. He was about to turn a double play that was going to end the inning and keep the game tied at two. That would be amazing if equipment could like get charged for yes. errors like a broken bat. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, honestly, with how imperfect error is as a statistic, like yeah, yes, Jesse, that would be that would be an Jesse improvement. I'm errors. I'm on board with he that. Errors so much. Uh, I hate errors these days. Rightfully they so. Don't give them. Yeah. That's also yeah. That's also true. We've seen an enormous <sighs> shift in what is 
apparently everything is a hit uh, in in 2024 Major League Baseball. But uh, yeah, I I made it until it was two one. Padres had a two one lead um, when I stopped watching this game, and I went to sleep. I eventually ran out of steam. My my planned approach was to sleep for a couple of hours before the game started, wake up at 3 a.m., take in a few innings. Um, and uh, yeah, I wound up not actually going to sleep at all at 1 a.m. And I just <laughs> stayed up until 3 in the morning, which turned into staying up until 5 in the morning. Yes. And then I just completely ran out of steam. Uh, but yes, I went to sleep. It was 2-1 Padres. And I was not at all surprised when I woke up to find that the Padres had lost this game 5-2. to two. Not at all. Not at all. And then yeah. Shohei got his first uh, hit. And of course, I did see the first hit. Yeah, we have that, that all sorts happened. of stuff yeah. to talk about when it comes to Shohei. But I want to talk about Mad Dog before we do that, because Mad Dog Russo was on my television this morning. It wasn't a great way to start my day. It was actually quite infuriating because after they had discussed that the ball broke through Cronenworth's glove, this man had the audacity to say, Cronenworth's got to make that play. I don't think he even knew he said those words out loud. I think it was just an automatic queued up thing in his brain that was going to play no matter what. He was going to say it at some point. But Cronenworth's got to make that play. Dog, his glove broke. The ball went through his glove. What do you mean Jake's got to make that play? Like, that's such a crazy thing to say. Like, it's a crazy thing to happen. I don't understand how the Dodgers um, have the baseball gods on their side, considering they have everything else on their side going for them, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe Jesse, what we just saw as breaking news recently is a little bit of like life adjusting and correcting itself because boy, do we have a breaking story about uh, Shohei Otani that I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. I do just want to go back and say, Jesse, that if that would happen to Cronenworth happened to me, I would quit the game of baseball. I would cry on field. Jesse, I would break my, PlayStation 5 controller into a million pieces <laughs> if on the game I went to feel the ball and the ball broke through my glove in the game as like a thing that can happen in the game I'll never play that game again never as long as I live my dad used to like think it was hilarious how like umpires would make like the wrong call in MLB the show sometimes oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, like, how, like, it's built in it's, oh, it's realistic oh, it wants to be God. realistic right? don't even get me started on that because the new pitching mechanics maybe it's because I'm playing on veteran things to you monsters but uh my I can't I'm having a hard time keeping my pitches in the strike zone and I'll say I'm a very good pitcher when it comes to MLB the show this new game it's out there but yeah, anyway I'm very again. good it, it's, it's all relative uh I I, I I will say i'm shocked that you haven't started making conspiracy theories about the dodgers like messing with jay cronenworth's they glove doing some did. kind of a they absolutely pulling a, a switch bet. or something between innings all i'm uh, saying is if you trace the paper trail on the manufacturer of that glove i have a feeling that the dodgers are a major investor in that company and there was foul play and I'm, I'm ready to throw conspiracy theories out there about everything because, as we alluded to, things only get weirder for the Dodgers than that whole game. This Shohei Otani situation is as crazy as you can imagine and also not because Shohei Otani uh, comes off as being an incredibly wholesome guy uh, <laughs> who is very nice <laughs> And Are you implying that it's, it's all a fraud? Is that what you're, that what I, you're going with? I could with this? apply that. I could absolutely <laughs> say that. I could say that he there comes is a, across as a nice guy, there is but a oh, just wait chance. till you see. Non zero chance. There's a non zero <laughs> chance. I'm not saying there's a big chance. I'm just saying there's a non zero <laughs> chance that Shohei Otani has a gambling problem. 100%. Uh, why, why, is that a, why is that a crazy thing to say? It's because... Oh, gosh. Because Shohei Otani's our sweet little baby angel it, yes. and you can't do anything wrong. Yes. Jesse, stop it. But there's it's real life, the Dodgers, right? And like, it, there's always... He's there's, not the good guy we thought he, he was. He's look, not. I've come to learn in life that <laughs> oh, it's not man. the no, don't meet your heroes thing as much as it's just... Like, sometimes in life when things seem too good to be true, they might be. Now... For those of you that don't know uh, what we're what we're making wild, even reckless <laughs> allegations about, let's go ahead and talk about it. The Los Angeles Dodgers have fired Shohei Otani's interpreter, Ipe Mizuhara. Uh, he was fired Wednesday afternoon after questions surrounding at least four at least four point five million dollars in wire transfers sent from Shohei Otani's bank account to a bookmaking operation, uh, which has set off an entire series of events. That bookmaker 
uh, was in California where it, it is illegal to have, you know, to gamble on sports. You cannot have a DraftKings account. You can't do any of that in California. So in order to participate in those events, old school bookies, right? We go to back to bookmakers uh, and it's illegal. And of course, uh, this bookmaker was essentially investigated by the feds and it was traced back based on checks that uh, that they had received back to Shohei Otani. And that's kind of what unraveled this whole situation. Uh, so according to multiple sources who spoke to ESPN, this ESPN article is incredibly comprehensive. Uh, and it's very weird too, because it's part of the story kind of involves the ESPN interview for this article, right? So Mizuharo incurred the gambling debts uh, to this bookmaker operation. And uh, it was a lot. He basically lost what sounded like a million dollars um, roughly, and then tried to bet his way out of that, which is never, uh, never a good situation for anybody. Right. I mean, that's the, the minute that you're there, that's bad news. Right. But, yeah. uh, then it gets, it gets stranger though, because of course the connection here and, and Mizuhara kind of taking the fall or at least being the one accused of the actual crime, even though the checks are coming from Shoei Otani kind of made sense. Uh, a spokesperson for Otani set up an interview uh, between Ipe and uh, essentially uh, the ESPN. ESPN, writer, a 90-minute right? interview. 90-minute yeah. interview, which he kind of confessed everything. He said everything was his fault. And in the interview... He said that Shohei was not the one doing any of the right. sports betting. It was all him. He said that he did not bet on baseball. Uh, that is something that, I guess, MLB interpreters are not allowed to do. He was betting on, on other sports, which presumably would be allowed, unless you're doing it in a state that does not allow such things, which Correct. was the situation here. Right. And so he uh, he basically said that Otani bailed him out, that he knew about it, and he gave him the money in order for him to pay off his debt. Uh, there is a statement about how he would promise not to gamble anymore as part of the agreement, would also agree to pay Otani back. Something wild that was discussed in this article, Jesse, is that this man was making, as an interpreter for a baseball team, $300,000 to $500,000 annually. And then he still needs uh, to essentially not, like, this is, it's just crazy. That's, that's, I he owes a million dollars in gambling debt. Like, I get even... it, but God damn it, I didn't know interpreters <laughs> made this much money. I should have stuck to Spanish. Yeah. I really <laughs> feel like I, I, I made a mistake in career choices here. But uh, getting back to this, obviously, uh, the, the weird part here is that then after he gave this interview, everything changed the following day, which is today, right? So today, ESPN was contacted by the same representative that set up the interview and was told uh, that they disavowed anything that he said yesterday, right. even though it seemed like the spokesperson corroborated the story the day before. And now uh, Shohei Otani did not know anything about this at all. And his lawyers started calling it massive theft, essentially. Right. And this is huge because this man was not just an interpreter for Shohei, but a friend, a really close friend. Yeah, and that's what basically makes this... paid to follow Shohei wherever he goes. And that's been the case since Shohei came into the league back in 2018 with the Angels. Uh, Ipe has been there from the very beginning. And yeah, he's not just an interpreter. He <laughs> There's stuff in here about him like carrying Otani's water bottle. And uh, they go over scouting reports before games together right. and whatnot. So this is a really, really big deal that Ipe is no longer in the picture. Like, Ipe has almost become a, a, a baseball celebrity in his own right yeah. because he's the, he's the interpreter. We watched an interview for, with him just before this. Yeah, yeah. He's an interpreter for the most famous baseball player, you know, that exists right now. So, uh, yeah, the, I mean, that part of it is a big deal. I know some people were like, oh, uh, Otani and his contract, he had something about if certain Dodgers personnel yeah. were no longer in place, he could opt out. Ipe was not one of it those Andrew people. Andrew Friedman, right? Yeah, yeah, Andrew Friedman. I think there were a few other people. Yeah. Ipe, at least from what I've seen, not one of those people. So uh, I think we can put that to bed. And frankly, even if Ipe had been on that list, people should understand that Circumstances it, can change because it's a voluntary thing. Exactly. Not exactly. Shohei it's, trying to escape yeah, his billion dollar contract. It's not that Otani deeply wants out and he's simply looking for an excuse to yeah. do so. It no. is that there are certain provisions where if he decided he wanted to opt out, he could if certain people left the organization. Absolutely. But yes, Ipe, not, not one of those people. And I don't think that this 
honestly has anything to do with Shohei gambling. I think the story that was told yesterday was probably the truth. And I think the alteration today was due to the fact that there are a lot of complications with them admitting that Otani knew about this. And Tim said it in the chat, but Tim said the problem here is this. Did Shohei know and initiate the payment? It came from his bank account. Then he retracted that, and that's what Shohei claimed fraud and terminated him. That is wire fraud, and in a wire fraud situation, Shohei would be complicit if he knew about it and didn't have the money stolen from him. I think if there's any fall guy situation here, it's the changing of the story that Ipe did so that he assumes full responsibility for it, with Shohei being able to essentially not have any involvement in this at all. Long term, this will probably just go away. And essentially, yeah. the man who was terminated is the one that's going to suffer the repercussions for this. But it's an interesting thing because, of course, wire fraud being a crime does impact Shohei Otani. And that's, I mean, that's not something necessarily he can just maybe buy his way out of. That could be huge uh, and, and a huge impact on his career, right? Uh, but, I mean, this whole situation really sucks um, if you're a Dodgers fan. And if you're not... That's all I'll say. But uh, yeah. we do want the Dodgers to be taken down a peg, and sometimes life finds a way. And that's uh, maybe what the situation might be a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Uh, right now, the the Dodgers have a lot of pressure on them with coming back from this Soul Series uh, and trying, like I said earlier, to get back to spring training, trying to have a regular season from that point on. And this is definitely a, a, a huge problem for the organization and for Shohei. Yeah, it's not it's not great. It's not a great look. Um, well, we'll see how this thing uh, resolves. I don't have a super hardcore take on it right now. I guess I don't. I'm not really buying into the narrative that Ipa is the fall guy for Otani having like these gambling no. uh, addictions no. or whatever. I I, I don't I knows. don't think that's true. No, <laughs> yeah, Derek, Derek is saying there's a non zero chance. Saying, non-zero there is a non zero chance. chance. Let's just be honest about this. If Tatis or somebody like that was caught in this exact same a scenario, thousand every per single fucking cent. person would a say thousand he percent. was involved in it. It's just because Otani's this lovable guy that everyone <laughs> but, thinks can but, do no wrong. But to be fair, you can laugh all you want, Jesse, but that's the no, goddamn he, he, truth. He's right. It's all based on reputation at times, whether how much someone's going to believe that you were involved or not. And there, but sho- there, there is there is no evidence that None. has been presented that Shohei Otani is guilty of anything. No, no, no. no. But so, it's, so it's the if, narrative that's going around on social media and such about this, especially with right, the right. change of the story. That's why I said I personally just believe the change of the story is to the fact that there are still crimes attached to wire fraud. Tim hit the nail on the head yeah. with that. And that Shohei could still be implicated as being complicit in the situation and charged with a crime should that happen right like should a wire fraud charge maybe 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 the prosecutor's a giants fan jesse i'm just saying <laughs> maybe you never know where people's allegiances are that would be huge <laughs> you know i'm just saying <laughs> oh uh, man yeah at least said he'll be just deferring the wire fraud charge oh god <laughs> she's fucking nailed it let's go at least never misses she, she has never missed never one misses. time no she has never missed not a single time uh of course Make sure you don't miss uh, out on checking out Circle K. Uh, I know, of course, uh, some of these hot takes require a cold, cold drink uh, to wash them away. Uh, You can do that at America's Thirst Stop. You can also join their Inner Circle program for free by downloading the Circle K app today. Terms and conditions apply at participating locations. Visit CircleK.com for details. But if you do, you will get uh, 25 cents off per gallon on your first five gas Phillips. You also save three cents off per gallon every day after that. You have a bevy of coupons in the app, as well as a buy five, get a sixth one free on a selection of Circle K products like pizza, coffee, and those ice cold fountain drinks. So make sure to check out Circle K today. You know there's one by you right now. Um, Let's see here. We also have Arizona Lottery, which as you guys know, they have been really uh, doing a great job of trying to get us out while this weather is beautiful here in Arizona and to experience uh, some wonderful adventures here in the state with their Arizona Adventure promotion. Right now, you can get down by playing with their Arizona Adventure Lottery tickets featuring three iconic landscapes, or you can check in at Destination Coordinates on their website, Geolocated Ventures at 10 destinations across the state from Flagstaff to Yuma, so don't miss out on that. You can also enter tickets online for a chance to win $1 million in cash and Arizona travel prizes. 
The Arizona Lottery says proceeds from ticket sales support environmental conservation, among other important initiatives across the state. The Arizona Lottery is not just about playing games and winning prizes. It is also about giving back to the state and its communities. Visit azadventure.com uh, for more information on how you can take an adventure uh, for a chance to win $1 million in cash and Arizona travel prizes. You remember at Gerald's wedding when they handed us free Arizona lottery cards? I do. Gerald's wedding was sponsored by Arizona lottery. Basically. Yes. Did the most win? incredible wedding ceremony gift it, you can give to the people. It really was. There. It was so exciting to sit down and have an Arizona lottery ticket with a single penny uh, in the little envelope. Yeah. They get yeah. Yeah, the pennies were in the end. They had everything. They thought Gerald they right. Gerald's thought wedding everything. was incredible by the way. Also, I want to say this, uh, I really enjoyed hanging out with my my PHNX folks, right? I like that. I liked uh, that we made it a company event. Uh, Jesse, Jesse wonderfully drove me all the way home, which, as you know, is in South Anthem. It's very far away from his house. So uh, God bless him. And we won't talk about Damon's night, will we, Damon? No, no comment. comment. No comment. <laughs> uh, but we are going to get into our spring training updates presented by Factor Meal Kits. Uh, so head to factormeals.com slash PHNXDBACKS50 and use code PHNXDBACKS50 to get 50% off. And I need me a factor meal right now because I'm hungry and these guys got food that's not good for you out there. And it smells great, but I want the factor meals that are good for you and also smell great and are delicious. So I need to get one of those out of the freezer. But uh, in the meantime, uh, or refrigerator, they're never frozen, by the way. Uh, <laughs> we got updates, not good updates, not great updates, but maybe... Maybe not at, terrible updates. Not terrible. Maybe things weren't as bad as we thought they were going to be because Eduardo Rodriguez, as many of you know, exited yesterday's game versus the Cubs with it was left lat tightness. Left lat tightness. That's like yes. up in here. Yeah, it's it's like here. It's huge, man. Like the lat is like your whole torso, yeah. as far as I can tell. Yeah, it's uh, what that's it looks not like. that's not actually it's like true. A big but muscle wall. Yeah, yeah, it can be more shoulder or it can be more back. And we were told this is more of the back area for, for Eduardo Rodriguez, which feels like a good sign. Corbin Martin, uh, he had a lat uh, tendon tear last year. That's what he needed season ending surgery for. That was more in the shoulder area and seems to be far more significant than what Eduardo Rodriguez dealt with yesterday. Uh, but yeah, the Diamondbacks continue to provide very few specifics on Erod's injury. We still don't know all that much. Uh, but here's what here's the latest from uh, from Tori Lavello at spring training earlier today. Still a uh, left lat tightness. Um, he, you know, tiny bit of discomfort. Tried to recreate that that feeling. Um, we could, but uh, we feel we feel good about him speaking up when he did and. F- we feel like we dodged the bullet. Um, we have discussed imaging. It hasn't happened yet. Um, so I'll keep you posted if it does happen. But uh, I was next to him when he was getting examined, and he seemed to be in good spirits. And um, the the medical staff was, was encouraged by what they got. It's good to hear. Yeah, I mean, sort of. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> so like, he says, I think we dodged a bullet. Which is, I mean, that that phrasing we often hear with contusions and things that are obviously very minor. That's sort of Tori's go to phrase in those situations. Uh, But that's not this. This doesn't strike me as being um, I don't know. You can hear maybe a little more concern in Tori's voice here than like when Christian Walker had a contusion and it wasn't a big deal. Yeah, well, they were just glad that his hand wasn't broken in that case. Right. That was a little different. This is one of those situations where uh, if it's. Uh, it can be lat tightness, but then it could be a lat strain, which is kind of right. like a sprain, right? So then you have degrees of it, right? So yeah, you there's have like first grade, degree or grade, or mild, first grade. and yeah. I don't know what the scale uh, terminology is there. But, but it can go from literally something that you miss a week or two for for a mild one versus a grade three, which would require surgery potentially. Yeah, so which I think is roughly you, what Corbin Martin had last year, something along those lines. Right. He certainly had surgery, and that's uh, that's kind of what Tori's talking about here, where you maybe talking about dodging that bullet right because if it's yes. a, if it's a variable degree or a variable grade then if it's a minor grade that at least means that surgery and everything can be avoided yeah that is a very good point the fact that uh, uh tory said he, there still has not been imaging done it doesn't mean imaging will not be done but 
as of this afternoon, imaging had not been done. And that is a good sign in and of itself. Like if there was real reason for concern here, the DPACs probably wouldn't hesitate and would just go ahead and do that. Uh, but yeah, uh, Erod was checked out by the medical staff earlier today. You heard Tori there say that uh, he felt uh, fairly fairly good. The medical staff was encouraged by by what they found. That was the way that, that Tori worded it. I like that. Um, so I think in terms of like a big extended absence, you feel pretty good at this point that that's not going to happen. But on the flip side, I don't know if Erod is going to be ready for opening day. Uh, that, I think, is still to be determined. And uh, we actually have another clip of uh, Tori Lovello talking about that very thing. Um, I'm going to remain optimistic that he can be, yes. But there's that's not said with a lot of certainty. It's not 100%. And I'm walking the fence. I try to give you guys definitive answers where I can. But he's still being evaluated. But today was a very encouraging sign. He came in and, and felt good. Do you, do you think you'd felt good enough. Let's see. Felt good enough. Felt good enough. Yeah, a little caveat at the end. I, so we're just not getting a ton of specifics here. And, uh, you know, you hear Tori say there, I'm going to remain optimistic that he could be ready for opening day. But... I yeah, I don't think that's really a guarantee. It's like what he said about Randall Grichik, and we know how that's going, right? Yeah, Randall Grichik also just kind of been in in limbo here for a while, still not you know running the bases at at full strength. So, uh, yeah, I I at this point and would be maybe a little surprised if Eduardo Rodriguez was ready for opening day. That's not based on anything concrete we've heard. That's just kind of my sense of the situation. Uh, but yeah, I don't think Eduardo Rodriguez is going to miss like three or four months or something like that. I think you've avoided those worst case scenarios. And that is obviously a very good thing. Well, how does that impact the fifth starter competition? Because obviously we know who the three guys are still involved. Now, does this open up the competition? To two of those three guys instead are we seeing tommy henry and ryan nelson both potentially make the opening day starting rotation at least until until he's good or do you think yeah that won't be needed i think i mean somebody somebody's got to start the, somebody's got to well the, yeah no, I mean, be the know, extra starting pitcher right, right? right so yeah i think i think that is probably the most likely scenario is that you would see uh two out of those three guys nelson henry and jarvis making the team certainly seems more likely to me that it would be uh, Henry and Nelson than uh, than you know Nelson and Jarvis or some some combination involving Jarvis. Both of um, the guys today shoves. Yeah, they did. Both Jarvis did pitch really well today, yeah. and and Henry and he pitched has well his too. Last couple of starts, as well, um, or at least a couple of outings for sure. Yeah, yeah. Jarvis has started to pitch well, so yeah. It it you know if Erod does have to miss a few weeks or whatever it is, it's just a matter of plugging in one of those guys, most likely into that extra rotation spot. And then a few weeks from now, hopefully you get Erod back and, you know, this winds up not being a big deal. Uh, we talked about Tommy Henry. Solid today. Three and a third innings pitch. No hits, no runs. One walk, three strikeouts, 44 pitches. Uh, a, a supremely Tommy Henry outing, right? Like, not going to be super flashy. Got the three strikeouts, but still no hits allowed. No runs allowed. Like, that's everything you want out of a Tommy Henry outing. He was good. Yeah, Tommy Henry was good. Uh, he talked after the game about what the difference was between his his last few starts and uh, how how good he was in this one. And uh, here's what he had to say. I think it had to do, you know, with the with the sequencing. Um, that was kind of the game plan. That was the the plan of the adjustment moving forward. Um, I just felt like, you know, through my first few outings, I wasn't getting a ton of off balance swings. I feel like people were on time very often um and that's kind of a you know a frustrating exhausting way to pitch so um we felt like that was the biggest area to adjust and you know i'm hoping moving forward that continues to be the case i think tommy henry might be manufactured by the same plant that produces all of the orioles players oh. <laughs> is that right i don't know they, <laughs> he's they a little like bit they... too tall right ah uh, yeah like tommy good. henry's but he's really a pitcher, tall so you're gonna increase the size based on like, yeah that's position, fair. right yeah, you know i don't know um, but yeah, how no. tall is he? Uh, like six, four, six, maybe six, five. He's really tall. Yeah. Every time I like haven't seen Tommy Henry in a while and then I walk in the clubhouse and he's there or whatever. I'm like, wow, Tommy Henry is really tall. I, I see the tallest of the, uh, I think he's the tallest of all the like young starters. Fott looks the tallest. I'm pretty sure he's taller than Fott, And I think he's taller than I'm very confident. He's taller than Ryan Nelson. Uh, he might be the tallest out of all the starting pitchers. Certainly taller than Zach Gowan. Certainly taller than Merrill Kelly, uh, Erod as well. So, 
uh, yeah, I mean, that's how they decide these these uh, starting pitcher competitions. They just line up by height, and then correct. You know, correct. that's that's the way they that's do why it. Bryce so. Jarvis isn't really being considered, right? He's shorter <laughs> than the other two guys, even though he pitched incredibly well. Three and a third innings he pitched did, today yes. for Bryce. One hit, one run uh, allowed, no walks, three strikeouts, nine whips in that uh, in that outing, including five on his slider. Yeah, yeah, he was really good. The slider continues to be a weapon. Uh, he's he's still using a cutter. We saw a few more cutters in the game today. It's a little unclear which, which pitches are the slider and which are the cutter, I think. Um, yeah, technically, Brandon Fott's listed at 6'4". The, none of these numbers, these numbers don't make sense to me. Uh, Brandon Fott, 6'4", Ryan Nelson, 6'3", uh, Tommy Henry, 6'3". I don't know if I buy that. I feel like Tommy Henry's taller than all of them. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, file a complaint. Jesse, Jesse's um, gonna go in there with a measuring stick and make. Sure I'm, not, I'm gonna accurate. I'm gonna make them all go back to back. We're gonna do all of yes, the various combinations. Yes. So we're gonna the, get to the yeah, bottom of it. We'll figure so. it out. This is like the first time that like research has been done, and Jesse's like, <laughs> nope. eh, I don't no, know if I buy it. It's so. there. It's written on a, a website. It's and real Derek like, and Damon energy there. Just know, whatever fits uh, your yeah. narrative, Jesse. Yeah, right. I don't. Uh-huh. I don't believe I don't believe Tommy Henry's on the internet. Three people can write whatever they want to on the internet. You guys know that. I wrote articles on the internet, but uh, what about <laughs> Jarvis, though, being considered? I mean, again, we know that this might open up, probably will open up to one of these other guys just if in the meanwhile, right? Uh, hopefully, hopefully it doesn't. Hopefully they just need one of these guys. But should they need to, it feels like Jarvis can't really win that spot. Yeah, this, the starter spot, eh, I would lean toward probably not, but he could still make the team as a reliever. Uh, we talked about this uh, the other day. Bryce Jarvis is throwing well, and if the D-backs want a guy who can give them some length out of the bullpen, maybe there's a world where all three of these guys make the team, where you have Nelson and Henry in starting rotation spots with Erod starting the year on the IL, and then uh, and then you have Bryce Jarvis opening the year in the bullpen. I think that's I think that's very possible. He was really good today. Bryce Jarvis had nine whiffs. Yeah. Um, just continues to get a lot of swing and miss. The fastball velo up eh, just a smidge from where it was a year ago. He's throwing a bunch of sliders. I think he's just kind of embraced that his slider is his best pitch against righties, and he's going to throw a whole bunch of them. Uh, his fastball, is he's kind of had to hide that pitch in the past. It doesn't generally play up to its velocity, uh, which I guess is part of the reason for adding the, the sinker and the cutter as well. But, yeah, I really like what I've seen from Bryce Jarvis, and if he doesn't open the year in the majors, it feels like he could play a pretty big role at some point. I know the Diamondbacks weren't going to get Blake Snell, and I don't even want to pay attention to his contract or if they could have afforded that or not, because that's like that. I feel like that's a depressing conversation that's going to result in me being sadder than I am right now. But what I will say is that is there any chance, any chance that this becomes a situation where Diamondbacks have to reach out and try to find somebody to fill this uh, for for the Erod spot, is for, that what you're saying? I'm just in just in general, where they yeah. just they just they just say we got to go. Probably, yeah, probably not. Uh, I would be pretty surprised if they did that. There are still guys out there. Uh, we touched on this the other day before Erod was hurt, and we were just talking about if yeah, the D-backs could do still, yeah, uh, you know, with with Nelson and Henry maybe struggling a little bit. If if that's something you'd look at doing, but I don't really see it. I think at this point you probably just start the year with what you got. Uh, maybe this means that Slade Sacconi does get stretched out as a starter. I will be curious to see how the D-backs handle him and if this situation impacts that at all. Uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, they, they have some, they have some depth. They don't have a ton of depth. They, I think they can withstand one injury in we, this we case. We said this. This is what this is what the minor league depth is for. And yeah, this isn't gonna most likely be the only scenario where where one of their starting players gets injured. And they're gonna have to look to some of these guys that have been kind of fighting either for a backup role or in the case of the pitchers for one of the starting spots to come in and, and fill that spot. And again, you never know what can happen with your career. If you can come in and be an asset to the team, right? Like yeah. you just never know what that time, uh, if, if you called upon that opportunity can do for you. So Tori was asked though about the Blake Snell signing again, because <laughs> we can't let it go. Well, he was um, asked about the Dylan C signing previously. That's true. Now we had asked him about the, uh, the oh, Blake yeah. Snell signing, and then when Jordan Montgomery signs with the Rockies, then we'll then we'll, Jesse, then we'll ask him about that. that. Don't do that. Are, are you really are you really uh, afraid of me just like doing a reverse jinx on the Rockies signing yeah, Jordan Montgomery? Come on now. 
<laughs> they, they got Chris Bryant too, Derek. What did that do? I have to play these guys a lot. I just don't. I don't want that. I don't want that energy. I don't here. think the Rockies will be signing uh, Jordan Montgomery, what, but the Giants did sign Blake Snell. This is what Tori said about signing Blake Snell. Not I'm not surprised whatsoever. Um, it's uh, it, it is it. Everybody seems to come want to come to the NL West for some reason, right? Keep the good players out of here. Um, but we embrace the challenge. Um, the Giants are going to be the Giants. They're going to be a good team without them. They're even better with them, and we know that. So we, we're going to respect every opponent. We're not going to take anybody lightly, and we're going to go out and play our game, try and, try and do things that we can do. It's just another really good challenge that this team will accept. He is sick over this. He is absolutely <laughs> sick to his stomach over this. He's just trying to smile through the pain. Yeah, you do that sometimes. I understand. That's what I've done most of my life. But uh, Tori might have jinxed himself with that comment yeah, he, that he made he about was, the Dylan Cease trade, right? Yeah, he when when we asked about the Dylan Cease move uh, a few days ago, Tori's words were, I wish the best players would quit coming to the NOS. And then inevitably, Blake several Snow's days later, Blake, Blake Snow, <laughs> Snow becomes a member of the Giants. And so Tori was asked if he uh, if he jinxed himself. And uh, here, here is what Tori had to say about that. So I jinxed myself. And right. Everybody's in the NL West. Right. Yeah. I mean, is there other leagues? What? <laughs> yeah. uh, no. Other divisions? <laughs> well, come on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he really is sick about it. He's <laughs> like, seriously, the NL Central is ripe for the picking. What are you guys doing? Why do you keep coming here? <laughs> Money. That's why. Um, well, of course, uh, we know he jinxed himself, but uh, today was a good day for the boys out there. Gino hit one of the Very long biggest home run. fucking home runs I've ever seen. <laughs> Someone hit at a spring training game. It felt so unnecessary. Did it reach the concourse? No, I don't think it reached the concourse. Feet, Jesse. It was it was long, but I, I I was actually a little surprised. It was four hundred forty three feet. I think it was like feet? like halfway up the berm or something like that. Oh. Uh, yeah, when when Gino gets a hold of a baseball, he oh. does get a hold of that baseball, and that baseball goes a long way. I love it, and uh, that's 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 Gino Suarez for you. It was also oh. one of the one of the worst pitches that a major league pitcher <laughs> could throw. Uh, this was a, or actually, I think I'm thinking of Christian Walker's home run. Which it felt like Christian Walker like barely even swung the bat, like he just tapped the baseball and it went <laughs> over the fence when he homered. Uh, that was on uh, just a, a curveball that was grooved like right down the middle. I don't remember where the Suarez pitch was, but it probably wasn't in a very good spot. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, well, Tori made a lineup change today, moving Guriel up to the number three spot, and Gabby down to the number six spot. Yeah, it sounds like he was asked about this before the game, and he did acknowledge this is something that he's uh, kind of trying out ahead of the season. Uh, maybe this is the way that the D-backs go when the Don't season like starts. It. Gabby Moreno obviously hit third quite a bit in the postseason, became yeah. the team's third hitter every day. We've Correct. seen some of that in spring training, and uh, Torrey is experimenting with, yeah, as you said, moving Gurriel up into that three spot, Moreno down to the number six spot. If it were me, I think I would maybe maybe make it depend on whether you're facing a lefty or righty against a lefty gabby moreno hit like 350 last year you kind of like the idea of him in the three hole against a lefty but against a righty uh gabby really picked things up toward the end of the year but for most of the season for a good portion of the season he wasn't a very good hitter against righty so maybe you uh, maybe you move him down to the sixth spot and then have lordis hit third against righties uh but yeah we'll see how they how they handle that he definitely has to get a get a good grasp of where he's going to play these guys during different you know for different matchups and all of that stuff and now is the time to try that try those lineups out and see what he thinks about them um i just i don't know i want to see gabby in that three hole that's all that's all i think that gabriel moreno is going to be a valuable power hitter for this team even though that's just my gut feeling and nothing uh as far as projections are concerned reflect that at all apparently he's not Going to hit very many home runs at all. What is he going to hit? Like eight home runs? That's what they have him at? Yeah. Hate it. Hate it. Source, trust me, bro. Right? <laughs> source, pulling, you're pulling one source, of those. Yeah. Source, trust Derek. You know, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I didn't believe in this team last April. So I guess I'm probably not a good source to trust. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think Gabby Moreno is going to be a much better hitter this year. And I think he's going to be a power guy. I don't know. We'll see. It doesn't matter very much. That's the last thing I'll say real quick is. 
batting order doesn't matter a ton, I don't think. You generally want your best hitters at the top, and the D-backs have that, I think, with Cattell and Corbin Carroll in some order, number one and number two. Yeah, but- After that, the D-backs just have a lot of pretty solid hitters, like in the three through seven slots, and I don't know if it matters a ton what order they hit in. When it comes to Gabby and what it what I felt like, or what many felt like he did so well last year, right, was taking what was given to him, right? And not hitting, yeah. not being a power guy, but being a guy that tend to get a lot of hits and and find the open gaps in the infield and drive the ball through, right? So uh, I, I just think there's value there as far as him being able to drive in Corbin Carroll and Cattell Marte versus Lourdes, who seemed inconsistent at times as far as when you could rely on him as that player to drive in those runs, right? But like yeah. you said, Lourdes Gurriel, great hitter. Diamondbacks have a bunch of good hitters uh, in the lineup after that. So it's... It is what it is. It's just, again, I, I think that we are starting to grow attached to the younger guys, and we want to see them get that opportunity. We want to see Corbin Carroll leading off. We don't want to see him down hitting low in the lineup anymore or any of that kind of stuff in 2024. But Yeah, that was the thing at the beginning of last year, wasn't it? Like Corbin was hitting fifth, I want to say, like fifth or sixth against righties, and then he was hitting seventh against lefties to start the year. And that was that was like a pretty major talking point there yeah. for a few weeks. and. Tori was kind of like, you know, we just want to see him show us a little bit more. And then, you know, we maybe we'll, we'll revisit it at another point in time. And sure enough, Corbin Carroll did move up in the Diamondbacks batting order before too long. Uh, and Tim is absolutely right. If Blaze doesn't make this team, I can't continue being a fan of this <laughs> franchise. Uh, feel the same way, bro. Uh, and we both should probably prepare to find new teams because I don't think Blaze is going to make it. And it's we'll not see. because we'll he's see. not good. It's because they want him to play regularly, just like Jordan Lawler. They want him to get those regular bats. But anyway, we appreciate you guys being here in the PHNX Sports YouTube channel. Of course, we thank you so much for those of you that have subscribed to the channel. If you haven't done so already, maybe consider doing it now. If you do that, you can sign up for notifications and you won't miss any of our shows when we go live. And also drop us a like. Uh, Gabby would very much appreciate that uh, as well. Of course, uh, if you ha- are listening on the audio podcasting side, make sure you subscribe over there. Leave us a review. We always appreciate that feedback. Uh, of course, make sure to make baseball more fun with our friends over at BetMGM. Right now, you can download the BetMGM Sportsbook uh, app on iOS or Android and sign up uh, using our promo code of PHNX. When you do, uh, you will receive uh, in bonus bets back up to $1,500 if your first wager uh, loses. Uh, You place your your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. All you got to do is sign up with that code of PHNX and deposit $10 into your BetMGM Sportsbook account. If the bet does lose, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Of course, uh, check out our friends over at the PHNX Bets. Uh, that's sometimes Damon, sometimes Shane, sometimes it's Aaliyah. It's kind of wild. So I did sure one this week, two and one. Two and one? Let's go. Not a big deal. Let's go. Not a big deal. But he just made people money <laughs> is all he's saying. And he might make you some more money, so make sure to check out the PHNX Bets podcast. Of course, you can sign up for BetMGM. Use that bonus code of PHNX. Place your first BetMGM Sportsbook wager through the mobile app for at least $10. You will receive $1,500 back in bonus bets. If the bet loses, check out the show notes for full details. And now listen to Shane talk about the disclaimer. Bonus bets expire in seven days. One new customer offer only. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Available in the U.S. Call 877-8-HOPE-NY-467-369-NEW-YORK. Call one 800 327 5050 Massachusetts. 21 plus only. Please gamble responsibly. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP, Arizona. one 800 bets off Iowa. one 800 981 Puerto Rico. First bet offer for new customers only. Subject to eligibility requirements. Bonus bets are non-withdrawable. In partnership with Kansas Crossing Casino and Hotel. See BetMGM.com for terms. U.S. promotional offers not available in New York, Nevada, North Carolina, Ontario, or Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Uh, Well, if you are here in Arizona and not Puerto Rico, make sure to bank with Desert Financial Credit Union. For more than 84 years, Desert Financial has been Arizona's largest, most trusted local credit union. They got me started on my home ownership journey, and they can help you as well. You can look to Desert Financial for checking and savings accounts, mortgages, loans, credit cards, investment options, and more. Make sure you bank with a uh, financial institution that has your best interest in mind. When you open a free checking account online, you'll get $200 in bonuses. Get started by visiting desertfinancial.com slash 200. You got up very early, waited for this baseball game, (laughs) and the way you got yourself pumped was by watching episode one 
of Snakes Alive. I watched the, yes, I watched the first episode of Snakes Alive, and then I also purchased MLB The Show, and I just had a like a full on like yes! the dawn of baseball <laughs> yes! season night, and then it regretted everything when I woke up and yeah. had gotten like three hours of sleep. But yeah, Snakes Alive, it was it was good, it was fun. It's so um, good. I guess they're going every other every other day. Yeah, that's what they said. They confirmed, I think, in a comment. There's no official listing, but it sounds like yeah, it's going to be every other day. So, so Thursday would be two episode two. Will be Thursday, yep. And episode one got me pumped for the regular season. Uh, they did move through last season pretty fast. Like yeah. episode one already gets you to the playoffs, essentially, right? So right. they kind of inform you on the expectations a little bit of last year, how good things were, how bad they were in July specifically. But uh, I thought they did an absolutely outstanding job of telling the story. They definitely showed an edited version of Tori's Notorious Connected to Dangerous speech, which I can understand <laughs> uh, and I'm fine with. And I, I get it. You can't have all the naughty words we say on this show. Uh, but uh, favorite parts, anything stuck out to you? I mean, I, I did love overall the candid nature of the interviews and stuff. I loved, I loved right away how it started out with them like telling Tori to look at like look at this camera and stuff like that like the, or or I think think it was that gallon maybe but yeah. yeah it was it was a really well done you know series of interviews and stuff and I, I can't wait to see more of it yeah it's it's very well done props to the D-backs team they've been killing it on on social yeah. with the, all, all of this stuff really um I mean for as long as I can remember they they've been doing a fantastic job <sighs> uh yeah I mean there there's the cliffhanger at the end right uh, which I guess we all know where that's going. That's yeah. the uh, the Evan Longoria. Uh, I mean, game game one of the postseason for the Diamondbacks really was like an Evan Longoria coming out party on defense, yeah. along with some very uh, well timed home runs by some of their young hitters as well. Uh, and, and what Lee says is absolutely right. It brought back all the stress of the Brewers series I'd forgotten about because yeah. man, things did not start. In the playoffs, like we wanted it, the no. motherfucking yoffs did not start like they wanted. They should have, right? And it's funny how far they went. But looking back on that, I have a distinct memory of, well, that's it, that's it. Closing up shop. Let's just turn. <laughs> let's. What are we doing here? Let's just go home. Why should we even play the rest of the game? I because remember things I was, were so bad to start off that game. I was yeah. finishing off a Cardinal show in here, and you guys were all watching out in the in the you know watching area and everybody was just like so sad and dejected oh, was, when i walked out it was, and it was jover and i remember i was like it's so over guys <laughs> it's so jover uh but uh i did love in the documentary um uh, in the first episode our guy ryan thompson like ryan thompson was an incredible interview on the show and not only that but i feel like i at least i've befriended him i don't know about jesse <laughs> but uh when he talked about wanting to do it for the boys you know what I mean? Yeah, like want yeah. to bring that like feeling the hunger of yeah. other people in the clubhouse. Yeah, it was just yeah. such a perfect example of that, you know, the whole mantra, right? And like rarely in time, like I, I I know managers do stuff to get their team pumped, right? And I know sometimes those managers have pre-prepared speeches and you know, kind of like ideas in mind. And we know Tori does that too. Like Tori is not. We talked a little bit about the 108 culture. We know Tori and the Belgian draft horses. That's something that he definitely loves to talk about. But there's something about the fact that, like, this, like, that the, the things Tori said seemed so just natural, right? Like, it wasn't pre planned. Yeah. Like, it was just such a moment of, uh, uh, you know, just a, a sincere, authentic moment where you were just speaking from the heart and saying the things that. Like you didn't like you didn't care about anything else other than just getting this team pumped and ready for for the playoffs and you know and and once they got in the playoffs reminding them about how important that connection between those guys were you know was but Thompson saying this it's it's again it's a reflection of how quickly guys came to this team and adapted to that mantra to that yeah. mindset right yeah absolutely i'm sure we're gonna we're gonna see the the connected and dangerous aspect of the diamondbacks come out throughout the course of this thing i'm sure uh, i think what stuck out to me most from the first episode is is really just how much of a movie game one kind of was yeah. in and of itself yeah i mean you had brandon fought starting that game for the d-backs he was not you know, he had a pretty good second half in the regular season, but it wasn't exactly an ideal scenario that neither Zach Gallen nor Merrill Kelly were available for, you know, the first game of a three game playoff series on the road. It was our worst nightmare coming in to like when when fought, 
you know, gave up those runs. It was everything that yeah, we dreaded that exactly. this could be heading into the playoffs because we knew Gallon and you know Kelly had to pitch in those final games of the season to try to get them into the po- playoffs. And and also just just watching back that first inning against Fott where he just gives up like dinky single after like he did not get hit hard in that first inning. Uh, but the Brewers, were, I mean, they were just finding holes. Uh, they were just finding ways to get on base, even though they weren't hitting the ball hard. And for Fott to come back, and I think he struck out the side to end that inning, uh, that was incredible. And, you know, Corbin Burns, like, Ben Fott against Corbin Burns, like, what a crazy pitching matchup that is. Yeah. The D-backs eventually getting to Corbin Burns with Corbin Carroll hitting a 440-foot homer, Castel Marte following it up with a homer like 20 seconds later. That tied the game, and then it was Gabby Moreno with the first of many dramatic postseason home runs putting the D-backs uh, ahead with the lead. It was just, I mean, that game in and of itself, we haven't even gotten to the Evan Longoria double play moment um, and another really important defensive play he made. It, it was just incredible. There were so many moments just within that first series in Milwaukee, and uh, yeah, uh, I think D-backs fans are going to enjoy every every moment of uh, of this docu series. I I like the way that they structured it. I like the cliffhanger that makes me not be able to, you know, I can't wait to yeah, watch. Yeah, the, the cliffhanger next one, right? that's just good. That's just good. Uh, good movie making right there. There's also something that I really like, which is Jesse and I are around these players quite a bit, and I feel like this is bringing out a side that we don't even get to see in interviewing them, right? Like. Some of like Christian Walker sitting down and talking about them facing Corbin Burns and their mindset in that moment in that game, I thought was, yeah, was, was interesting because we don't really, you know, Christian tends to be like a fairly nice guy and I'm not saying he wasn't nice, but I'm just saying he was like, he was like, this is Corbin Burns. We knew how dangerous he was. And like, we, we wanted to get him, you know, like, it's like, it's like to hear that. And, and again, to share some of those moments that we haven't seen or, or have heard about up to now is, is really cool. There are things, though, that need to be included in this series, right? Like, I could watch an entire episode on uh, Alec Thomas planting the flag in Philadelphia. That could be <laughs> one whole episode, just, just that moment, you know? Um, but, like, someone else said, uh, can't can't wait for, like, the four home run game. Oh, my God. Jesse yeah. Yeah, that's, the other, that's the other thing is, is you know, we've, we've talked off the air a little bit about just just the the idea of making a docu series about a postseason run that ended in a loss right it's a little weird i'm not sure that every major league franchise would would do this but the more i thought about it and and just watching this first episode the more it just occurred to me that like this was a story worth telling this was a story that was really extraordinary and yeah. just unpre- unprecedented. I mean, just amazing in so many ways with so many incredible moments along the way that it, it kind of justifies the whole series in and of itself. Just all of these moments that, that there were to capture along the way. So, uh, yeah, I still I'm, I'm kind of curious if anyone feels that way, if they like don't want a, a docuseries made about a, a you know a World Series run that ended in a in a four games to one defeat. But I, I think I understand why I haven't really seen much of that at this point. The, some of the best baseball movies end with the team actually losing, right? Like they don't all end Do with they? them winning. Major League, they don't make it. They just, sure, they, I think fair. they just win in the first round of the playoffs or a wild card game or whatever. Yeah, it's the first, it's the first series of the playoffs. The A's, the A's don't win in money balls. So that's right. There's so that. I mean, yeah. there's, I mean, there's something to be said about it still being a compelling story, but. Uh, Damon, anything you want to uh, make sure gets shown in this? Considering I know it's probably Jerry P related. <laughs> yeah, when uh, when Jerry after we were down uh, to the Phillies two one and it felt like was it two one or uh, they were down they were down two one but they were also down three two yeah I forget which one it was but when he was in the locker room and they were asking him like like how do you guys feel and he's like feel like we're gonna win the next game. That was leadership. Yeah, he said, oh, yeah, that was fire. I remember that. I got pumped by it. I got pumped about that. Patrick was, like, loving that. Yeah. (laughs) I remember him in in, uh, in Philly, I think, after they were down. uh, I'm not sure. Maybe it was was when the series was tied, 3-3, going into Game 7 in Philly. And Geraldo Perdomo said, uh, there is no, uh, like, Wednesday. There's only tomorrow. 
uh, I don't remember which exact day of the week it was, Go but talk. he was he was really honed in on just the next day, and and that was a good quote. Made made for a good quote for my story. So I was yeah, I was happy about that. Uh, and yes, also indicative of the of the leader that I think Geraldo Perdomo has become. I'm trying to think of something else. No, I mean it's like <laughs> what can I say? Like the four home run game game, like that has to be in there. Uh, ending Kershaw's career, that was pretty fun. <laughs> the the whole Dodgers series, I just can't wait. Let's that, just make the Dodgers series. Yeah, like can we make episodes. that the documentary? Yeah, that's. Let's fine. do more episodes than games in the Dodgers series. <laughs> <laughs> Part one of game one. Well, I know one thing that needs to be included here, Damon. Uh, let's just go. If this isn't in there, this whole series is a failure. <laughs> it was for us all year. It was only a matter of time. Let's fucking go. He's shirtless. I'm shirtless. We're fucking going to the goddamn World Series, Patrick. You think I give a shit right now? Let's fucking go. <laughs> I mean, that deserves uh, to be part of history. That's like, you know, don't wince at that. We might, fine. we might grab our pitchforks and torches if they don't put that in. Yeah. I would I'd never I take don't my think shirt gonna, when you're I don't think they're going to, I don't think they're going to, no. they're going to put that in. Yeah. Whatever. I'd be uh, waiting a while on that. I, I mean, I blame the champagne, honestly, but I could also blame uh, maybe the OGs. I don't know. But, uh, of course, if you want to maybe have yourself a wonderful celebration uh, like you saw me having there, OGs has launched two new products made with live rosin and Rick Simpson oil, uh, the OGs Naturals and the Big OGs, which I've been known to eat whole. It's fine. Uh, OGs Naturals are vegan gummies made with live rosin, and they're available in a sweet clementine flavor. And the Big OGs, our Omega version of Peg's Raspberry Orange RSO, one of the company's most popular products. It's perforated into 10 slices. I said it right that time, Elise. Uh, and each slice is 10 milligrams uh, for a total of 100 milligram THC or just 100 milligrams in a one bite uh, gummy, whatever, however you choose to use it. But to learn more about OG's gummies and where you can find them, head on over to ogsbrands.com. Uh, Elise says that post game was unhinged and yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably the best see way i don't know ever. these things like mm -hmm. i didn't go back and watch you or listen patrick to any of these you shows have no idea what patrick had to put i up only with. know it's what happened on the show oh, when man. i was joining from wherever ballpark listen, the, the it's, diamond it's very much at. for the best listening to my probably voice there, i think is a perfect example of what you missed out you could barely speak was Derek? that like a two-hour show <laughs> you the, mean? the amount of f-bombs me and Derek were just letting fly was probably just <laughs> not okay yeah. I got an email about it. It's fine, um, but whatever. Uh, March Madness is here, and before March Madness starts, uh, of course, you can join in with us at PHNX and our friends at Illegal Pete's for their bracket challenge for free. Prizes for the top three finishes include diehard memberships, shirt and gift cards to see, because you need a shirt if you're Derek, uh, shirt and gift cards to the PHNX locker, and illegal Pete's gift cards. Check out our socials for the link to sign up, and get on that now. I think you have to select those tonight or tomorrow morning. So we do not have a lot of time for that. So get down on that. Of course, also get down on Legal Pete's, uh, which is of course here to bring you a win with their legendary sound check deal. Uh, bring in your ticket stub from any ticketed event and get a draft beer or house margarita for one cent, one penny. Illegal Pete's wants to celebrate with you, whether it's a pregame or postgame party. They got you covered on all your game day needs. Must purchase an adult entree to redeem Illegal Pete's sound check deal. Illegal Pete, your go-to spot for burritos, buddies, beer, and, of course, Damon, uh, who's our people's producer. And we want to thank him, of course, for his wonderful work. You can follow Damon Dog uh, at Damon Dog. That's D-A-W-G. Uh, we are Damon's Dogs. Bark, bark, bark. We're doing the thing again. Uh, but, of course, uh, we are also on Twitter. You can follow us at Cap underscore K, man with a K. Jesse is at Jesse N. Friedman. Our show is at PHNX underscore d -backs, but all roads do lead to at PHNX underscore sports on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, appreciate you guys so much for stopping by. Thank you guys for your time. We'll be back tomorrow. No game tomorrow. 1 p.m. start. No game tomorrow. So make sure to join us. We'll probably make some more wild allegations and make Jesse roll his eyes at me uh, a little bit more. But uh, in the meantime, <laughs> uh, make sure you guys have yourself a wonderful night. Again, thank you for stopping by. And remember, kids, baseball is fun, but it's so much more fun when you don't have to pay your interpreter's gambling debts. We all silly like the mayor. 